Um, I, I want to uh, take a minute and do a little review. And before I do that, I got another praise I want to add to that. I had uh, breakfast with uh, Bob Russell this week. And uh, uh, we were talking about a bunch of stuff. But then I said to him, I said, Bob, now the people in the class loved you and would really like to see you come back. And so is that, you agree? Yeah. yeah. So he has agreed to come back and he has a, a message on patriotism that is, is fantastic. So we're trying to figure out a date for him to come back. Bobby said something to me yesterday about maybe having him come back for 9-11. And I thought that was a good time. So if we can get him here, uh, he'll be here in a few weeks and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so that'll be fun. I want to do a little uh, a review, and, and Bart, uh, again, uh, I don't want to leave you out of this, so we have now today two charts in a map. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the saying that you say about charts and maps? Whenever you study the Bible, you must have a map and a calculator in your hand. That's right. That's right. Okay, so, so I don't have a calculator. Uh, but I've got fingers, so, but, but, but anyway, we're, we're kind of go through and I want to do a, a little bit of a review. You remember this chart, right? Uh, so real quickly, uh, Rosh Hashanah occurs here, uh, and it's two days instead of one. Why? Okay, I have witnesses to see the So it requires two witnesses to observe the moon, and then the witnesses have to report back to whom? The high priest and the high priest declares a day. Well, there, there's some time lost and they didn't want to make mistakes. And so they do it for two days instead of one. Later on, when the calculations got better, obviously, and they could change, uh, select the full moon, uh, what they said is, well, okay, one is a, a scriptural mandate, one is a rabbinical ma mandate. So, but they celebrate Rosh Hashanah for two days, which is also called what? What else is it called? Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets. That's exactly right. So that's, that's Rosh Hashanah. Now, uh, remember, the interpretation of these things depend on your eschatology, what you believe. Um, and, uh, of course, I believe these things, but someone may not. Um, you've got uh, Elul, which is the month before. And actually, um, the, the, the period of repentance this is a period of repentance and seeking forgiveness and doing good works all to, to be able to ensure your position in the book of life, okay? Now, it's from Jewish perspective. What's wrong with that? Hmm. Huh? It's not by works. For it's by grace you've been yes. saved. Right. Right. And this down yourselves to give to God, not by works that any man boasts. So it doesn't make any difference how many atoning works they do. They're never going to achieve salvation without Christ, okay? So uh, we've got Rosh Hashanah, okay? And then one of the things I said is that there are some theorists who say that from the end of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is seven days, which mirrors um, the seven years of tribulation, okay? And in the middle of that tribulation, what happens? Desiccates, desiccates the, trump, uh, the temple. Um, and so the Jews are not accepting of that. And so they're, they're all off protests and two thirds of the Jewish uh, nation are, are killed. Um, and then you've got the Day of Atonement with reconciliation. And that's the Zechariah verse where um, uh, it says that God will pour out his grace in the house of David uh, and they will mourn, uh, meaning repent um, and, and turn to faith. And then you've got tabernacles, which I believe is a thousand year reign. Now, again, depending upon who you are, you've got might have different eschatology and that's fine. Uh, but, the, but the important thing is, I, I want to point out here, is that these numbers, 1,470 and 3,348, uh, 3, what, what are those numbers? 1,470 and 3,348, what are those numbers? Do you remember that? I talked about that last week. Huh? Huh? All right, let me, let me go to the next one. Remember this chart. There's a second chart, Bart. Uh, and, and we talked about the period of patriarchs, Moses, kings, and prophets. Now, again, that doesn't mean that, that Joel was the first prophet. We pointed out last week that Moses was a prophet, and so was Abraham. So, uh, but these are periods in Scripture, and there are lots of uh, things in between them. But essentially, what I said was, imagine having to perform those same 
sacrifices were somewhere in the vicinity of 1,470 years. Can you imagine how arduous that would be? And why do I say 470? Where does this 70 come here? Uh, where does that 70 come from? Huh? A, D, 70. So the temple is destroyed, right? And so at that point, there's no more blood sacrifice, okay? And we're going to come back to that later on. But what's interesting is that most, Moses prophesied that God would bring Israel back to their land permanently. And God did that exact thing 3,348 years later. Where did the 48 come from? 1948. 1948. There you go. Okay, so 3,348 years later. Now, that's a little bit, we, we, we kind of went over that more in depth, but I, I just want to touch bases on that. There's another thing I want to cover, and that is the map, because I had to get the map up here. <laughs> and everything points to Petra. Why? Well, you, re you remember what the Babylonians attacked Israel, and it wasn't just one attack. They continued to attack starting in uh, 605 uh, uh, BC and continued through 586. And, and in 605, who did they bring to, to uh, Babylon? What segment of the of the Jewish population did they bring to Babylon? Oh, the elite. The elite. Okay, the elite. All right. So they brought them, and then uh, Josephus tells us that some of them were thought to have fled to Petra. We don't know that for sure, but uh, Josephus uh, indicated that was a possibility, and that was the the word of mouth at the time. Now Moab and Edom are now part of Jordan. So you've got, uh, and, and so is Ammon. Um, and Daniel tells us that uh, uh, Ammon, Moab, and Edom escaped the Antichrist kingdom. Now, what does Daniel have to do with eschatology? Everything. Everything. Uh, how, Everything. how come, Brian? Well, he's very um, exacting, including dates. Uh, and that's why when Jesus said to his people, you should have recognized the hour of my visitation, and he was very disappointed in them because they didn't recognize. And that was from Daniel and Isaiah and the prophets. But Daniel goes hand in glove, as I said last week, with Revelation. You can't have one without the other. Daniel does, Ezekiel does, Revelation does. Uh, and so we've been studying Leviticus and we, we've been going to all those books and more, uh, including Exodus as well. So in Hebrews. Um, so so you've, got, uh, you've got Petra here where, where Josephus indicated they, they stayed. But Evidently, they're going to be somewhere in Edom because here's Ammon, here's Moab, and here's Edom. Okay, and Edom, um, part of Edom or in Edom is Petra. Now, can anybody explain to me what Petra is like? Remember what I said last last time? It's been fortified. Go ahead. It's protected. It's fortified, protected. How so? Mountains. There's, you know, there's mountains all around, and there's a narrow grid. Yeah, there's a narrow port that they say only one horse can go through or one. Yeah, a narrow passageway. That's exactly right. Passageway. So, and that's where supposedly, as a matter of fact, you knew this. I, I think I've told you this before. You may have forgotten, but there have been people actually packing up supplies in Petra for years. Uh, so we don't know that for sure. We don't know that that's going to be the place where God hides a third of the Jewish people. But essentially, um, there's a pretty good guess. So now today, uh, so, so that's what we've covered. And we've covered already Rosh Hashanah. We've already covered Yom Kippur. I even blew a chauffeur for you. Uh, did everybody like that chauffeur? Yeah. I, I was going to bring it in and blow it again today, but I figured, nah, I'd spare you that. Um, but uh, when we did, we studied the, the practice of each feast. And then we looked at the prophecy of each feast. And then finally, the fulfillment of each feast. So Today, I want to I go through and begin to talk about the practices. And what we're going to do is, uh, and, and I think this is important, we're going to look at the original practice. And now we're going to look at the current practice. And then finally, we're going to look at, okay, with all that going on, what is it that you believe that God wanted them to learn? Okay? So the, the original practice, the current practice, and what is it that God wanted them to learn? Okay, any questions so far? All right, let, let, let me begin with the original practice, and I, I want to ask you a few more questions. So, so tabernacles, this was the harvest season, okay? And there are multiple harvests, but this is the end of the harvest season. Uh, and it's a completion also of the religious season. 
and it represents the complete and finished work of God. And after Egypt, God gave his people the feasts, and he also wanted to give them rest. But they disobeyed, and, and quite frankly, they lacked faith. But Tabernacles is one of three pilgrimage feasts. What are they? What are the pilgrimage feasts? Uh, Passover. Passover Christ. is one pilgrimage feast. Pentecost. Oh. Pentecost is the second, and the third one is Tabernacles. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are the dates of trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles? What are the dates? Anybody remember? All right. Tell me the date of of uh, of, of Rosh Hashanah. You all want. I'm sorry? Tishri 1. Tishri 1. Yeah, Tishri 1. Okay. Yom Kippur. Huh? How long are the days of all? How long are the days of all? You know, if I gave a pop quiz there, you'd all be in trouble. All right. So, so, so Yom Kippur is on the 10th. So, so, uh, so uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah begins on the 1st of Tishri. Okay. Yom Kippur is on the 10th. The 10 days in between are called what? Days the days of awe. And then what's the date then of tabernacles? 12th. Oh. 12th? No. Good guess, though. You're getting closer. <laughs> okay, well, I just said it five days later. Five days later is tabernacles? The 15th. There you go. Hey, wow. That's great. Okay, so the 15th. So the first, the first is what? The first of Tishri is what? First of Tishri. Rosh Hashanah. The 10th of Tishri. Yom Kippur. And the 15th of Tishri. Tabernacles, all right? Give yourselves a round of applause, right? <laughs> all right, now let me ask you a couple more questions, okay? How did they verify those dates, starting with the first of Tishri? Yeah, they had, they, had, they, had, they had two Levites who would verify uh, the moon. Okay, and they blow the they blow the shofar. Uh, and how many? This is this is a tough one. That's a trick question. But remember, they sacrificed bullocks, and I told you uh, they started with uh, the thirteen on the first day. And they, do you remember the total number of bullocks they sacrificed? Oh no. You don't remember that? Okay, it was 70 bullocks. Okay, so they, they sacrificed 70 bullocks, and those 70 bullocks actually represented 70 nations. So, so they prayed not only for themselves, but they also prayed for other nations. Yeah, Jackie. So on Rosh Hashanah, if they didn't see the moon until the second day, does that shift the calendar? or? Uh... Well, it did. It, 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 Theoretically, it could, but they didn't want to make they didn't want to make that mistake. So as soon as they saw the full moon, they blew it. The problem was on the front end, they they may have been into that first day already pretty far before the high priest got word, gave them the okay to then blow the blow the trumpet. So that's why they did it for two days. Okay, all right. So uh, let's take a look at the original practices first. Now remember, this is this is in contrast to Yom Kippur. Tell me the atmosphere of Yom Kippur. What, what is it like? Morning. It's morning. What else? Repentance. A period of repentance, a period of seeking forgiveness, a period of trying to do good works to build up your, uh, to get yourself in the book of life. And so this is by contrast, a period of celebration, of festivities, of dancing, of all <laughs> kinds of things. And, and, and so people are ready. Can you imagine? It's the end of the harvest. It's the end of the religious se season, and people are ready to celebrate, and they're celebrating God's goodness over the past harvest, aren't they? And, and and the temple was central to that festival, central to that celebration. And, and a rabbi made this comment. I, I love this comment. He who's not seen Jerusalem during tabernacles does not know what rejoicing means. So wouldn't, wouldn't you love? To, to be there? Wouldn't you love to see that, to enjoy that, to experience it, to feel what it's like? I mean, they still celebrate it there. As a matter of fact, they're increasing. I, I, I read uh, uh, in one of the articles I read that, that last year there were 48,000 pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, who went there to celebrate tabernacles. 
so so it's a it's a festive event, and and Solomon knew that, okay, because it was a it, it was a gathering of pilgrims. He knew that there would be a lot of people. Now you know how many times did Solomon actually personally talk to God? Do you know that? I I really studied it and found out that it was at least three times that God appeared. Can you imagine that? God appeared to him and talked to him three times. Now, now, why do I say that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of strange. How many people have ever had God appear to him and talk to him? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, and yet tell me about Solomon's life towards the end. He kind of blew it. How so? What did God tell him not to do? And he violated and did. He married foreign women and not just one or two, right? How many? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a thousand and, and six hundred concubines. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever it was, it was it was a lot. Okay. It was a lot. And, and and so he had he had visited in fellowship personally one on one with God, and yet he violated God's word. Okay, what does that tell you about the strongest of believers? God clearly told him not to foreign, to marry foreign women. Why? Why did God tell him that? Yeah, they get involved in idolatry. They worship their gods. All of those things, and Solomon did that. Yeah, Alvin. Yeah. In a lot of different ways and not just in wives. Well, well, let's take a look at what Solomon did because his temple was dedicated on tabernacles and scholars say he chose that date because it was tabernacles. And he also uh, had this feast in mind when he prayed. He prayed this prayer. Jack, can you, can you read that prayer? When the heavens... When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. And when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive their sin, forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Now, now I said earlier that God appeared to Solomon three times. And so what I want you to do is take a look and listen to what happened when Solomon prayed. So he's dedicating the temple. He finishes his prayer. Jack, can you read 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3? When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Can you imagine being there and seeing this? Okay. That would have certainly given Solomon credibility, wouldn't it? But it would have been an awesome appearance. You know, they couldn't enter the temple there was a physical force there that kept them. And I think a physical force that forced them to the ground in worshiping God. What scripture say about that later on? What's going to happen someday? Every, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Solomon was so excited about this, so excited that he extended actually the Feast of Tabernacles that year for another week. He extended it for another week to continue celebrating. God had filled the temple God was present with them. He was tabernacling with them. Uh, and, and so Solomon was joyous. And so were the people. All right. So tabernacles is also called booths. Okay. And this is a booth you can see there in the background. But God told him to dwell in booths for seven days. And, and, and that was to remember that they had to stay in tents and booths in the desert as God drew them out. Can you read Leviticus 23, 42, 43, Jack? Live in booths for seven days. 
all native born <laughs> Israelites are to live in booths. So your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Now he did that for 40 years. Did he have to? Did he have to do that for 40 years? Did he have to extend it out for 40 years? Why did he do that? The 12 spies came back and 10 were unfaithful and the people refused to take the land. Well, there were only two that were faithful, though. Two, Who were they? Two were faithful, Caleb and Joshua. Joshua, okay. And God told them, well, now you're going to have to, because you disobeyed me, you're going to have to wait until this generation dies and it was by the over 20, you know, so it was 40 years. But, you know, despite all that disobedience, God provided for them in the desert. How so? Huh? Their shoes and clothes didn't wear out. That's one. How else did he provide for them? Manna. Gave them manna and food. How else did he provide for them? Water. Water. Gave them water and he protected them. Okay, so, so despite all their disobedience, God took care of them. <clears throat> well, well, how long after they left Egypt did Moses send scouts to the promised land? <clears throat> Think about it. Huh? It's about two. About two. Hmm? In the first 40 days, in the first 40 days, he sent spies out to, to scope out the land. In other words, instead of 40 years, Israel could have had it done in 40 days. Okay, 40 days. And yet they didn't do that. They didn't obey. They were cowards, except for Caleb and Joshua. And by the way, who went into the land? Who went in? Finally, went into the promised land. Caleb, Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua went into the promised land. So these booths, and you can see here, this is a Jewish community, and the booths had uh, walls and woven branches and thatch roofs, and they provide shade for the day and they allow stargazing at night. And it was important for them to contemplate the stars and look at the. How many of you have ever? This is a great time, by the way. I say uh, to to look at the stars. Why? time of year why is it a great time huh you see tons of meteor showers all the place and all the way into september okay it's almost like god's announcing okay rosh hashanah is coming uh but but it's beautiful to watch and god wanted them to watch this they wanted he wanted them to see what was going on in his creation how vast it was how beautiful it was how massive it was and 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 the other thing they do is they bring this citrus fruit which is called etrog uh, and, and, they, and they brought it to the temple, and it was a symbol of the fruit in the promised land. And that's what Peter was talking about at the transfiguration about booths. Uh, can you read Matthew 17, 1 through 4? After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter cracks me up. I mean, I mean, here is this profound moment, and, and he wants to do something, which... which I, I can't say that I blame him, but but uh, so he wanted to put up booths because it was the season of booths. They were coming from the festival. All right, so uh, Tishri, as I said, the seventh month, and the he. By the way, the Hebrew name for that Tishri came from Babylon, didn't it? The Hebrew name is Ethanim. That's in First Kings eight two. Can you read that, Jack? All the men of Israel came together to King Solomon at the time of the festival in the month of Ephanim. The seventh month. All right, so there are there, there are seven uh, uh, days of celebration, and the eighth day is the closing day of the feast. There's no work again. Okay, it, it's also called the feast of in gathering, and it's the last harvest. Uh, Leviticus twenty three thirty three to thirty six. Jack, the Lord said to Moses, "Say to the Israelites, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the Lord's feast of tabernacles begins, and it lasts for seven days." The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no regular work. For seven days, present offerings made to the Lord by fire. And on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. 
it is the closing assembly do no regular work all right so it's the equivalent uh, I, I i read one commentary where it says the equivalent of israel's thanksgiving uh, and by the way this is a bullock this is a picture of a bullock that, that's a big animal okay and they sacrificed actually bullocks for 17 days and they went like this 13 the first day 12 the second 11 the third uh, and, and they do that for the first three days, and it drops by one each day until the seventh day. And on the seventh day, seven bullocks are offered for a total of 70 bullocks. Well, that's because what they're doing is praying for nations and around them, and they're sacrificing one bullock for each nation. But remember, all of this points to Christ and Christ's first coming and his second coming. We'll go over that more later when we get into uh, the prophecy and the fulfillment. But what I want to do is, Doug made a good case. I want to revisit this. Doug made a good case that Jesus was born in tabernacles. So I want to look at some facts here. It says the shepherds were in the fields in Luke 2a. Okay, can you read that, Jack? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So you have to question, was this in December? Well, in Judea, it's cold and rainy in December. So it, it, it's, that's not going to happen. It wouldn't permit it. And Jesus was likely born then in late summer, early fall. And, and what reinforces this is the fact that Joseph and Mary were traveling for a census that never, ever would have happened during the winter. And finally, there's John's birth in Luke 1. Um, and, and he's born to Elizabeth and Zechariah. And Zechariah, by the way, was what? Uh, he was a priest, okay? So let's, let's take a look at this. First Chronicles 24, actually it's 24, verse 24, lists 24 categories. How about that for 24? Lists 24 categories of priests. Zechariah is from Abijah. Each group worked two weeks. Abijah served in mid-June, in Luke 1, angel Gabriel tells Zechariah that Elizabeth will conceive, okay? And then Mary conceives in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Uh, Luke 1, 26, 27, Jack. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so, so Mary visits in the sixth month. Uh, and and so let's do the math. Nine months for Elizabeth is in March, okay? The sixth month or six months later is either September or early October, exactly when Rosh Hashanah is. Uh, and exactly, by the way, Rosh Hashanah is part of the feast of what? Tabernacles. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles are all considered the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there, there were two ceremonies that are really, really cool here, okay? Uh, and, and they acknowledged their need before God, and that food came from the rain that God gave them, okay? And they thanked God and asked them for more rain this season. Now, I was trying to think of how to explain this to you, and I was thinking of, uh, I grew up in Chicago, okay? I grew up in Catholic schools as a Catholic in Chicago. And of course, as a Catholic in Chicago, going to Catholic schools, I was a Notre Dame fan. Okay, anybody relate to that at all? <laughs> I was a Notre Dame fan. I learned a Notre Dame fight song in second grade. Okay, <laughs> at Notre Dame, when you go to a anybody ever been to a Notre Dame football game? Anybody? Okay, so you're going to know what I'm talking about. At Notre Dame football games, which is fun, the band does a concert on the administration building. Okay, and and that's the building with the golden dome. So they do a concert. But at the end of the concert, people start lining up on a walkway that goes from the administration building all the way over to the stadium. And then on both sides of that walkway, they leave the walkway open with enough space because it's a wide walkway. On both sides of the walkway, there are people probably about <coughs> six feet deep. And the band marches through playing the Notre Dame fight song. And it gets everybody psyched up because as they march through, okay, uh, folks follow in behind them and follow them all the way over to the stadium. It's a great, anybody ever participated in that? It's really, isn't it fun? Yeah, it's really a fun deal. 
Uh, and, and I think about this. Well, you know, the high priest did the same thing for the water libation ceremony. He would leave the temple and there would be people lined up all the way along his pathway, excited, cheering, celebrating as he walked to the pool of Siloam in a gold pot, picked up water, walked back to the temple. In both ways, people are there to observe him, to cheer for him, to, to encourage him. And all of a sudden, he pours that out the basin of the altar, along with some wine that he pours out the basin of the altar. This is a festive time, and that's the water libation ceremony. And what they're doing here, and, and, and not unlike Notre Dame, uh, he is the people are getting involved in this process and getting excited because they're praying for rain in the coming season where they're thanking God for the rain that he's given them and the crops that he's given them, but they're praying for rain in the coming season. And so if you take a look at Isaiah 12, three, that's what it's talking about. Can you read that Jack? With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It's see, you see, it, it, it in fact is a joyful period where they're drawing water and it's a prayer for rain, but it's also a prayer for hope for God to pour out his spirit, as it says in Zechariah 12, on the people of Israel. Okay, now the temple lighting is another story. How many of you grew up Catholic? All right, tell me what the Paschal candle is. What, what, you remember the Paschal candle yeah. it, it, around Easter time and it was in the church? Well, tell me about it. Christ candle, isn't it? Yeah, no, it, was, yeah. it was a, it was a <laughs> large <laughs> candle because it would burn, burn uh, for a all huge candle. Days. It was supposed to be symbolize the presence of, uh, of the Lord. In, in our church, it was probably 20, 25 feet tall. Yeah. Okay. Now, feet. now think of these candles, okay, in the temple. There were three of them, 75 feet tall. Okay. Now, first of all, how thick do you think those things have to be? I mean, Bart, you're an engineer. How thick those things do you think have to be? Yeah, really thick <laughs> in order to stand up there. And so they have to have a pretty good wick on them too. So these things are huge. And there were three of them in the middle of the temple. Okay. In the court of women is where they held them. And, and there were three of them there. In addition to that, the people were all there because the water libation ceremony had occurred at night. Okay. And so people who were standing on the sidelines, uh, I, I'm sure had torches and lights, okay? Well, they brought all of those torches and lights into the temple. And can you imagine? It lit the temple up. As a matter of fact, you could see it all over Jerusalem. And, and, and several, what's interesting about it is both at the water libration uh, ceremony and the temple lighting ceremony, some of Jesus' most profound prophetic statements from him came. Okay, so we're going to get into that when we get into the prophecy side of this. But the symbol was that the sanctuary of God was the light of the world. Was the light, and of course, all of this. Who's the light of the world? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, so it's all pointing to Christ. Now, uh, Jack, can you read this because uh, this is a this is a picture of the temple. It's a model of the temple. And it, it, it's probably much brighter than that. Uh, but can you read this quote? This is from um, Bruce Scott, who wrote a, a book called The Feast of Israel. Three golden candlesticks, 75 feet high, were lit by young boys climbing tall ladders. And the light from these candlesticks could be seen throughout all Jerusalem. Respected men of faith danced and sang in front of these candlesticks while carrying burning torches. As the ceremony progressed through the night, the priest blew the shofar three times in the manner of Isaiah 12, 3. Quote, therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. The evening was characterized by exuberant joy, a wonderful occasion that no one wanted to miss. See, this is party time. Bobby, if we were younger and lived in and around Israel, we'd have been there. It'd have been a big party. Uh, so... So essentially, people are excited about this, and it was regularly observed during Jesus' day, and some of his most important statements, as I said earlier, uh, on his messiahship occurred during the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? Well, let's take a look at some of the current practices, and we'll come back to some of that stuff in a minute. Um, and, and, and really, building these temples or these, these booths 
occurs right after Yom Kippur, so the next day. And specific materials are used, and they're guided by the Talmud, and they decorate with festive ornaments. Usually the kids do the decorations. Older, uh, older ones build, actually build uh, the booths. Uh, but they invite holy guests, as well as the poor and the needy, and that's part of their tradition. And there's also a modern-day sukkah, uh, which is what they call them, uh, in addition to booths, they call them sukkahs. Um, and, and there's a modern day sukkah mobile that brings the sukkah to others. How about that for innovation? Okay, modern day. So they got the sukkah. I couldn't get a picture of the sukkah mobile, but it exists. Just think Oscar Meyer. Yeah, yeah there you go. Oscar Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> Oscar Meyer with a big bullock. <laughs> Oscar Meyer with a big bullock. Uh, but, but the family patriarch then uh, gathers certain sprouts and branches. Jack, can you read Leviticus 2340? On the first day, you are to take choice fruit from the trees and palm fronds, leafy branches and poplars, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. All right, so these, you can see in the background, these yellow look like, almost like uh, lemons. Those are etrogs from the sit, what's called a citron tree. And they're bound together along with some other branches, and they're waved in rejoicing. They're, they're waved three times. I'll get to that in a minute. But it reminds them of the fruit of Israel. And it's held in the left hand, and the lulav is held in the right hand. And there are four species of plants mentioned here. The fruit of goodly or beautiful trees, and that's, as I said, probably the citron tree. Branches of palm trees, which don't smell at all, but they're, but they're pretty. And then there's boughs of leafy trees, uh, and they're likely, they said, likely sweet myrtle trees. And then willows of the brook, those are willows that grow near water. So these four are carried together, and, and, and again, the etrog in the left hand and, and the lulav, which is what they call it, in the right hand, okay? So they bring the lulav in the synagogue and wave it at key points, and they do this in the morning service each of the seven days, and some do it at home. So they, they, they hold it over their head, and they take it from their head down to the floor, and they do it three times, and they do it three times in each of the directions. Um, uh, they start, I believe they started uh, uh, west, south, east, and north. I probably got those directions wrong, but can you read this quote, Jack? This is their prayer. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us concerning the waving of the lulav. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life sustenance and permitted us to reach this season isn't this a great prayer isn't it great what are they missing who's the king of the universe jesus, jesus. jesus is the king of the universe right and, and it's right in front of them and they miss it as a matter of fact part of their yom kippur ceremony is a wedding feast okay and yet they're missing they're missing the king of the universe or a coronation feast i should say not a wedding feast coronation feast uh, also, the idea here is to praise Nash. Now, we talked about the lulav, and it's shaken um, again when the halal, halal is, is read, and that's Psalm, they read all of Psalm 113 through Psalm 18. And they say, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. And, and interestingly enough, the end of Psalm 118 uncannily predicts Jesus' life. Psalm uh, 118, 22, Jack. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone that the builders rejection has become the capstone. And I told you earlier, Lulav is uh, really waved three times. I'm sorry, it starts with east. East, south, north, or east, south, west, and north. Um, a rabbi explained this. Can you read that, Jack? The Talmud gives two reasons why we wave in these directions. To praise the God of the heavens and, and the entire earth, it's four directions. And as a prayer that God withhold bad winds from the four directions and bad dew from above and below. Meaning we ask that the natural forces of the world function in harmony with man rather than destructively. Since Sukkot falls at the start of the rainy season in Israel, 
the four species are, are brought as a way of entre entreating God that the winter be wet and bountiful. So they're praying. And why do they want the winter to be wet and bountiful? <clears throat> huh? To water the ground for their crops uh, for the coming season. Okay. Also, the synagogue there, the synagogue, is also has a booth. Now, this is more elaborate booth, and it depends on the local synagogue and what their needs are. Uh, sometimes they have elaborate dinners, sometimes they have treats and snacks there. But after the festivities, people rush home, they eat, they drink, they, they sleep, they drink, they live in their sukkahs. And, and meals vary, but there are all kinds of things served. And also they serve holiday cakes, strudels, candles. Uh, they're provided along with ladder bread. Now, why do I say ladder bread? What, 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 what would strike you about ladder bread? It looks like Jacob's ladder. Okay, that's exactly what's going on. Genesis 28, 12, 13, Jack. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. So even today, uh, with that ladder bread, it's reminiscent of God's word and what God did in God's interaction with those people. So they give it, they get that, they remember that, they talk about that, they study that, but they don't get where it points to. But one day they will. Zechariah promises that one day they will. Now, on the final day, let's take a look at that. The congregation actually circles the synagogue seven times, carrying the Torah. They carry the Torah scrolls. Why would they do that seven times? What's that reminiscent of? Jericho. Jericho. Okay. After the seven time, the willow branches are beaten till they fall off beaten until they fall off. And what they're doing is they're shaking off their sins. They're beating. Uh, it's a symbolic beating off of sins. And they say a final prayer and they conclude. And they conclude by reading a portion of Deuteronomy and parts of Genesis by what they call bridesmen who are esteemed members of the congregation. Okay. So, so that's how the celebration and the feast ends. Uh, and, and, and as I said earlier, it is quite, quite celebratory. As I said, Torah scrolls are carried. And besides repenting and praying, I told you earlier, they pray for 70 nations. And there is much joy and singing and dancing. And some even think they need to get drunk to help celebrate. That was a joke, but it's true. <laughs> All right, uh, Jack, can you read this from Leviticus 23, 36? For seven days, present food offerings to the Lord. And on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present a food offering to the Lord. It is the closing special assembly. Do no regular work. Okay, so we've got all that. And I want to ask finally, what is it that God wants us to learn from Sukkot or booths or tabernacles? And I've got, I've got a few things. Number one, God created, and we're going to deal with the prophecies next week. But God created seven feasts so we would be able to approach him. And when I say it was his Jewish folks, his covenant people first, and then the Gentiles. But he wanted people to approach and honor and worship and trust and rest in him. Why did he do that? Because he's a relational God. He's not a God we have to appease. He's a relational God. A lot of other gods, a lot of false gods have to be at peace, not God Jehovah. He is a relational God who loves us. But he's also a God who is holy. And I think, quite frankly, sometimes in our churches, we've missed the fact that God is a holy God. And there's a lack of reverence for our holy God. God's holy and they were limited. They had to go through a high priest, an imperfect high priest, with an imperfect blood sacrifice. And I think that's the point. Uh oh, we got a got a little got a little guy there. I think we got rid of him. But God's holy, and He wants us to be holy, and He wants us to understand His standards. And His standards are perfection. Okay, now 
Hebrews 9 tells us, and it speaks of the importance of blood sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, it says in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now that's interesting, but after all, in all of this, God still wants us to know that he's provided shelter and that shelter comes through Jesus Christ, who's in the tabernacle of God. And it's there for the Jews and Gentiles alike. Amen? So I think that's the first lesson. The second one is that God uses the feast to point out how sinful his people are and how holy God is. Now, I was thinking about this, and really I thought about, you know, that's simply a fact. It's not a vengeful beatdown. It's just a fact. God is a holy God. And in Romans 3.23, what does it say? What does Paul tell us? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the Old Testament does that too. Ecclesiastes 7.20, Jack, can you read that? There is not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. So Old Testament, New Testament, it's consistent. God knew his people consistently came up short and they needed a savior. And he provided it for him. Third, God was showing us the futility of people working over and over and over again to atone for their own sin. It didn't happen in the Old Testament and it doesn't happen today. Again, we're all sinners. Here's another one in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 14, uh, 2 and 3, Jack. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do you think that's pretty clear throughout the Bible? That we consistently fall short. We're all sinners. And repentance, works, fasting at any time are fruitless without Christ. They're fruitless without Christ. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, Jack, 4 and 5, then 8 and 9. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, I, I think there are plenty of believers who get involved in ministry and get involved in doing things, not because they feel like they're called, but because they feel like, well, I've got to verify my salvation. I've got to do these things to convince myself and other people that I'm saved. And that, those are the wrong motivations. You are saved by grace through faith. And that's it. And if you don't do another thing, if you're saved by grace through faith, you're, you're fine. But God has prepared works for us to do. And our prayer ought to be, all right, God, please show me, direct me, guide me. What are those works? And I've heard, uh, I can't remember his name, but he said, well, find out where God is working and join him. Blackaby, yeah. Find out where God is working and join him. Too many times, we often look for a big ministry for ourselves. And quite frankly, maybe it is that God wants us to give a cup of cold water to people or help people. And so I would encourage you to find out where God's working and join him in that. I love that saying. Now, at best, these other things, repentance and works and fasting, are temporary. But, but that's not even true anymore. Why not? At least for Jews. Why isn't, it, why, why, why isn't the repentance and the fasting, why is that of no effect anymore? There's no temple. Again, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Now, what did Jesus mean when he told us to be perfect as the Father's perfect? What did he mean by that? What was he talking about? The Greek word here for perfect means finished or complete. Finished or complete. So how do I, as a believer, become finished and complete? Through the blood of Jesus. Huh? Through the blood of Jesus. Say it again. Through the blood of Jesus. And everybody said. 
through the blood of Jesus. Because I can't do it myself, can I? It only comes through Christ and him crucified. Now, the work of the Holy Spirit sanctifies me, but the blood saves me. Amen? And then finally, God wanted us to know that one day, sometime in the future, we will achieve perfection through him. Now, listen to what Paul has to say about this. Uh, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Now, this is 13 and 14. So if you could read 12 first. And this is the English Standard Version. Not that I have already obtained this, or am I already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, this verse should be an encouragement to all of us. Why? What's Paul saying here? I'm still a work in progress. Isn't that what Paul's telling us? I'm a work in progress. Okay? So we're all works in progress. And so when I make somebody mad in here, I'm sorry, but I'm a work in progress. That's not an excuse. That's not an excuse, but it's the truth, isn't it? And that should give us a certain amount of relief. That doesn't mean that it's a it's occasion of sin. What did Paul say in Romans 6? What then? Should we sin that grace may abound? And what did he say to that? May it never be. So that's not an excuse for our sin. But what it is, an encouragement to get up and try again, over and over and over again. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome that, overcome that sin. We can overcome that weakness. We can overcome that failing. See, Paul was holding on to that for which he was also laid hold of by Christ. Okay, so we're not holding on to Christ. Christ already grabbed us and pulled us out of that muck and mire, and he's holding on to us. But what was Paul holding on to? He was holding on to the perfection which came through Christ. That's in Hebrews 10, 4. Can you read that real quickly, Jack? Uh, Hebrews 10, 14. Or 14. Uh, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Do you hear that? Do you, listen to this again, okay? By one sacrifice, he's made holy. It, but because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Perfect forever. Okay, so, so what he's also telling me is I'm not going to lose my salvation, okay? Because he made me by one sacrifice perfect temporarily forever. forever okay you see see the hebrew feast the hebrew sacrifices the hebrew repentance was temporary but christ's finished work is for what forever. what is it now forever. forever okay and paul also knew that perfection was promised to him and also to us first peter 5 10 and the god of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And NASB says perfect, okay? That translation says perfect. So what was God doing with all these feasts, okay? I think he was pointing to something greater in the future. And for the Jews, they knew that. But they were waiting for and anticipating a Messiah. But guess what? They still are. For believers, believers in Christ, it's not only the return of the Messiah. It is that. But it's also the other promises he made. And as Paul did, we cling to him. We cling to those promises when we're praying and we're dealing with turmoil and we're dealing with violence and we're dealing with transgenderism, we're dealing with all the stuff that we're dealing with on a regular basis, we're clinging to God's promises that he is in control, that he has won the battle, that the battle is over and we who are his, who are overcomers will join him in his glory. Amen? 
I, I read a book by, one of the books I read on feasts was by Dr. Victor Buxbazin. That's quite a name, Buxbazin. But Jack, can you read the quote? The prophetic message of tabernacles is that there is shelter in the tabernacle of God under the wings of the Shekinah glory for the Jewish people first and then for the Gentiles. I love that. And I love that we're included in it. And we might not have been had the Jews not rejected Christ.